The majority of people only remember the Bodlerized version of Judges, which they learned in Sunday school. Thomas Bodler didn't like some sections of William Shakespeare's plays, so he rewrote them, leaving out the naughty bits, and his name is now engraved in history. Similarly, some of the less appealing components of judges' stories are omitted, such as concubines, murder, phallic symbolism, and so on. As a result, while many people are familiar with certain characters in the book, such as Samson, Delilah, Deborah, and Gideon, many are unfamiliar with the rest of it, let alone its broader tone and purpose. What were the judges? Who were the judges exactly? What did they do and who were they? They are referred to as judges in English, however, this term does not accurately reflect the meaning of the word originally used to describe them. When we read that Samson or Gideon judged Israel, the Hebrew word means that they were troubleshooters who saved God's people from themselves and others. They are never given a title, but are described in terms of their accomplishments. Indeed, God is the only person to whom the term is applied throughout Judges. He is the judge, and he is in charge of resolving their issues. It would be more accurate to say that God is the savior or troubleshooter who works through these heroes through his spirit for the people's welfare. They are concerned about justice within the nation, but mostly with exterior issues, as the people are surrounded by hostile nations who attack them at different times. The Ammonites three times, the Amalekites twice, the Moabites once, the Midianites once, and the Philistines three times. The kings of Jericho, Moab, and Hazor are also mentioned specifically. God's people had arrived in a densely populated area among people who were mostly opposed to their presence. They were seen as intruders. The only reason they were in that area was because God had given it to them and they were to use it to punish the local population by wiping them out. As a result, the book isn't simply about individual heroes or the study of personalities, but also about entire peoples, the second level of history. Individual Stories The book's stories are surely engrossing. There is a sparse use of words, yet there is plenty of interesting detail in vivid descriptions that bring the characters to life for the reader. The quantity of space allotted to each character varies a lot. Gideon has three chapters to himself, Deborah and Barak each have two, yet some only have a single paragraph. It seemed as if the more sensational they were, the more room they were given. Clearly, the author's purpose is not to give a balanced account of each hero. It is easy, however, to get the impression that the book is about a series of folk heroes who saved the day in whatever situation they faced. We read early in the book of Caleb's younger brother, Othniel. Othniel was the first of the biblical judges. Judges chapter 3, verses 8 through 11. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed against Cushan Rishathaim, and the land had rest forty years. And Othniel the son of Kenaz died. All we know about him is that he provided forty years of peace to his people. We read about Ehud, the left handed leader who strapped his eighteen inch sword blade to his right leg to conceal it. Due to the fact that the majority of people were right-handed, it was common to search the left leg for weapons. As a result, he was able to take his sword into a secret meeting with Moab's king and thrust it into the king's belly. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gera the Benjamite. The Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon of Moab. Now Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, 
which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. After Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, Leave us, and they all left. Ehud then approached him while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in after the blade, and his bowels discharged. Ehud did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed in over it. Then Ehud went out to the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. After he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. They said, He must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. They waited to the point of embarrassment, but when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. There they saw their Lord fallen to the floor, dead. While they waited, Ehud got away. He passed by the stone images and escaped to Sarah. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills, with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab your enemy into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Not one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. We read of Shamgar, who killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Judges chapter 3, verse 31. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. We read of Deborah and Barak. Deborah was a prophetess married to Lapidoth. Her name means busy bee, and Lapidoth means flash in Hebrew. Deborah would settle disputes by hearing the answer from the Lord, and on an occasion recorded in Judges, she told Barak to lead the people into battle. Barak was adamant about not going into combat without her. Senior officers in Israel always lead the army into battle, both then and now. God was enraged at Barak's reluctance and told him that the enemy Sisera would be humiliated, and so it turned out. Judges chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you ten thousand men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kedesh. The following story is about Gideon, one of the most fearful men in the Bible. He placed some meat on an altar, and the meat was consumed by divine fire. As if the fire wasn't enough, he then sought the Lord for a sign from heaven. God delivered another sign in the form of a fleece that was dry one day and wet the next. Gideon had to learn that conflicts are won by God's might and strategy. Gideon learned not to place his confidence in human resources when God reduced his army from 300,000 to 300. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. 
When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the God of the Amorites, in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands at Ophrah of the Abiah's rites. Judges chapter 6, verses 1 through 24. Gideon is offered the kingship by his troops following his triumph over the Midianites, and Abimelech is the next figure we read about. The people request that he establish a dynasty. Some say that he should have accepted, but this is clearly not God's time to choose a king. The people's problem, Gideon says, is that they haven't looked to God as their king. Following Gideon, the leadership is in the hands of a number of people. Abimelech asked the people whether they would prefer his sole leadership to leadership by Gideon's 70 sons as a group. He is duly installed and proceeds to murder his brothers. Things worsen as his thirst for power reveals that he is unconcerned about the welfare of the people and he is eventually killed in combat. Then comes Tola, who receives only the brief comment that he led Israel for 23 years. Judges chapter 10, verse 1. And after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years and died and was buried in Shamir. After him, Yair led Israel for twenty-two years and had thirty sons who, we are told, rode thirty donkeys and controlled thirty towns. Judges chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. And after him arose Yair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. He had thirty sons that rode on thirty ass colts, and they had thirty cities, which are called Hovath Yair, unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Yair died and was buried in Kaman. Ibzan of Bethlehem had thirty daughters and thirty sons, who all married outside the clan of Judah. Elon led Israel for ten years. Abdon, who came after him, had forty sons, thirty grandsons, and seventy donkeys. Again, no more details are given. However, when we visit Samson, we discover a great deal more. His given name literally translates to sunshine. He was raised as a Nazarene, which prohibited him from drinking alcohol or cutting his hair. It's a remarkable story of a man who had issues with women. He married, but the relationship ended before the honeymoon. 
He then went on to an unidentified prostitute before finally settling down with Delilah, a mistress. Samson was actually a weak guy despite his physical power. His problem was not so much with his relationships as it was with his character. His charismatic anointing enabled him to perform many incredible feats of strength, but the Lord's Spirit ultimately left him. The Philistines kidnapped him, blinded him, and put him on a treadmill, making him the laughing stock of the Philistines. The blind Samson was led by the little boy to the pillars of the temple, where he pulled the whole temple down. In his last five minutes, Samson did more for his people than he had done in all the years of his life. Human Weakness Judges is no exception to the Bible's honesty about the flaws and inadequacies of the people it describes. The book's characters have a number of flaws. Gideon was fearful, continually asking for signs, and made a gold ephod a priestly pullover, which subsequently proved to be a snare to Israel, a relic that had become an object of devotion. Jephthah was the son of a prostitute who made a reckless vow. Samson treated his wife poorly, slept with a prostitute, and took a mistress. They were not strong characters, nor were they holy people, yet God used them. Divine Strength How did these less-than-ideal people accomplish so much? It was not due to their own efforts. Their secret was that the Holy Spirit came on them. They were all charismatic people. As we read about how these people were able to execute extraordinary acts, Judges gives us vivid illustrations of heavenly strength acting through weak people. The most famous example of this is probably Samson, but there are many other incredible stories. This is particularly crucial to remember because the Holy Spirit only anoints a few people in the Old Testament. Only 12 persons out of the 2 million people who lived in Israel at the period received such anointing, according to Judges. We should also notice that the Holy Spirit only comes on people for a short time, not permanently. The text, for example, says that the Holy Spirit departed Samson. An anointing spirit touched people for a while in the Old Testament, rather than an indwelling spirit who stayed with them. However, the Bible also speaks of a woman of great character called Esther to watch how she was ready to perish for her people. Click here.